Hello and welcome to another lesson on soundproofing. Today is going to be part two of my series on how to build a pro control room. So if you haven't already, check out part one. Uh, it's going to help you understand sort of what I've built already with the isolation side of the control room. And then today we're going to finish it off with all the acoustics and understanding how the rest of the control room is made. Before I jump in, I do want to let you know that I have a free soundproofing workshop. If you're interested in building your own professional control room, then getting the isolation and the acoustics right is super important. So to check that out, just go to soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop. That's soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop. All right, let's jump into this lesson on how to build a pro control room part two. All right, so here is the box of the control room. And so I'm going to actually show you guys real quick what this thing looks like. And I apologize already, this is me using SketchUp, but here's a side cut view inside the control room. Now this is a Philip Newell design, and this is a design pulled directly from his book, Recording Studio Design. And I learned so much just from building this out and reading a book is one thing, but actually trying to design it and build it yourself is another. Um, so I'm gonna go through in this lesson today exactly what all this is that you're looking at in front of it. So we're going to start through the different isolation uh, acoustic walls and talk about the speaker mounts and all this stuff and, and why Philip Newell does what he does. But first off, I just want to show you, this was a gigantic room. As you can see, they didn't even use all the ceiling height, but they did use most of the, the width in this and um, concrete bunker, you know, two double walls, a floated concrete floor uh, right there, which you can see there. Um, and the little tiny space after it's all said and done, this is what I really want to kind of bring home to you guys is that so much of acoustics and sound isolation is using up space. And then you're left with what looks like a small space, but you can see around it just how much space we're using um, in the final design. I mean, this is just incredible in terms of ceiling height that's lost. And then also the amount of space used in the back and ultimately on the sides with the acoustic walls and things like that. So that's the important part. So what we have here is I'm going to break it down. We'll start with the ceilings and then we'll do the walls and, and the front wall and, and talk about a lot of these different things. So here's our isolation wall over here. And this is a concrete wall, you know, it could be cinder block filled with sand. He, he fills his block walls with sand using mortar to seal it all up and, and it makes it extremely heavy and great at stopping sound with a, I think it's a five to, excuse me, five to 10 centimeter air gap in between, which is roughly like four uh, inches uh, or so. And then these are laminated extra strong beams that are holding up our isolation wall. And just to show you here, I'm pretty sure he doesn't make this very clear in his book, but probably using some sort of half inch, then there's a dead sheet or what you might call mass loaded vinyl. And then another half inch layer of plywood. This is probably one pound mass loaded vinyl in there. And then this could be, he uses cotton waste felt. I find cotton waste felt extremely hard to source here in the United States and honestly find online anywhere. Um, so if you have a good source for cotton waste felt, that's awesome. Otherwise, I recommend just a one inch layer of acoustic insulation. This could be, I like to use the, the Knopf Ecos insulation. Um, you can use 1.6 pounds density if you want or three pound density, but the 1.6 is a little cheaper. Or something like rock wool could work as well, but it, it is more expensive. Now, so that's our ceiling cap. So that's our entire isolation system. And I just wanted to talk about that first. Then we have a nice big gap between our ceiling and our acoustic ceiling. So this is the outer isolation ceiling. Um, I should say inner isolation ceiling because the actual concrete ceiling up here, uh, which I haven't drawn, is freaking so high up and far away from this. Uh, so this is the second ceiling. And then here's your technically your third ceiling for your isolation structure. And so here we're doing the one inch uh, mineral wool insulation, we'll call it for now, or cotton waste felt, the one pound uh, mass load of vinyl, and then another layer of insulation, one inch insulation. Then we've got, again, the half inch drywall, plasterboard, chipboard, wherever you are in the world, same thing. One eighth inch, uh, one pound mass load of vinyl, and then another half inch of drywall. So that sits on top, that fills the top of our acoustic ceiling. And all of this is to help with low frequency absorption um, 
and seal off the acoustic ceiling. Then I would just fill it with, um, you know, the cheapest insulation you can find. This could be pink insulation, uh, Owens Corning pink. Um, it could be cotton waste felt again is what he uses in his designs, Philip Newell. So some sort of absorbent fibrous material would go in these cavities so that they don't resonate. And then at the bottom here, you're going to see there's a seal and this is going to be sealed to the joists with uh, another layer of mass loaded vinyl or a dead sheet. This could be rubber. It could be anything that has elasticity and weight is really what you're looking for. And, and that will be sealed up. And this creates that diaphragmatic absorber in our ceiling. And you'll see the same thing in our walls in a second here. And then here again, just to absorb some of the higher frequencies, we have the one inch of insulation again after that. Next in our ceiling, this is where it gets really weird. These are called wave absorbers or wave guide panels. And this is something that Philip Newell and other top studio designers use a lot. I've never seen it or heard of it talked about in the home studio design market ever. So this is why I think it's fun to look at these things. But instead of doing a ceiling cloud that's flat with insulation, um, Philip Newell and I, I think a few other designers use what are called waveguides, which essentially is a piece of chipboard or OSB or plywood, whatever's cheapest. And this one is just about a half an inch or so here. Then attached to that, glued to it, is going to be the mass loaded vinyl again. This could be half pound mass loaded vinyl or one pound, whatever's cheaper for you on your budget. And then again, on either side, I would put the one inch uh, of the Knopf Ecos insulation board. So the one inch would be taking the two inch boards and cutting in half. I don't know if they make one inch boards, um, but any sort of one inch uh, to three quarter inch fibrous insulation is good. Again, Philip Newell uses the uh, cotton waste felt. So he, I love this idea of using reusable materials if you can find them. Um, and, and it gives you just enough fibrous absorption to do the work that you need on these panels. These are all angled towards our monitor speakers and we'll talk about the monitors in a second here and they go and they hang with chains i didn't put the chains and the hooks in here but essentially you would put a hook and then a chain and angle it so that these are all angled roughly towards the monitors the idea is that the base frequencies in this go emanate up towards the ceiling they get kind of broken up by these waveguides hit all this insulation here go up and then bounce back coming down through it all over again and the end result is really not much of anything coming back to your ears so you're hearing just what's coming out of the speakers uh, and that's the goal of the control room so that's our ceiling. The last part here, which um, this is going to be a lightly framed, it could be one by threes, it could be two by fours. It doesn't have to support any weight. It's just literally going to hold fabric and it's going to cover everything. Breathable acoustic fabric like Guilford of Maine here in the United States or any fabric you can blow through is what's going to line this entire studio. You can put some nice pieces of wood to accent this, make it look a little less like just plain fabric walls, but that's really what you're getting at. And then from the fabric framing, you can install your lights and stuff into the framing of the fabric layer. So there, this is what's so crazy is that your final ceiling height, this is about eight feet and our total ceiling height here from like the floor to the very top of this, uh, was about 25 feet. So <laughs> that just shows you just how much space you lose. They could have of course made this taller if they wanted to, but I don't think it was necessary for the budget. It would have just cost a ton of money. So this is kind of the minimum amount of space that Newell decided he needed uh, in order to get all his acoustics in there. Now, let's look at the back uh, area of this as well. So this is, again, a fabric one by three panel just holding up fabric um, in front of this back waveguide panel. And this is really cool. These waveguide panels here, and I'm just going to get rid of some things and kind of get rid of our waves. Okay, great. So now we can sort of see this wave guy panel uh, same thing as the ceiling so built out of the chipboard the mass loaded vinyl to help damp the vibration of the wood and then two layers of insulation on either side and this is a separate framed wall that i framed out in front of our acoustic wall here and these again would be held by chains and hooks which i did not diagram in here just to save time um, but these panels are angled at 45 degrees and we have 10 total, so five going this way and then five going the other way. And the low bass frequencies are going to fly out of these ATC, high-end ATC monitors, hit this waveguide panel back here and get broken up. 
Then what they're going to do is they're going to hit our first layer of insulation. So this is again, one inch NOF Ecos insulation or some sort of uh, fibrous mineral wool. Ideally, I like stuff that, since this is actually part of the breathable side of things, I try not to use like too much formaldehyde or something really toxic if I can. And then this could be cotton waste felt. And then you have your uh, mass loaded vinyl dead sheet here. Again, this is usually about one pound. It could be a half a pound if you're on a budget. Then we have a two by four wall. This wall is uh, filled with insulation. So I'm just going to show you this real quick. Okay, so there's the insulation between the uh, 16 inch down center joists. And then after that insulation, we're going to hit our first half inch layer of drywall, a dead sheet, mass load vinyl, half inch drywall, one inch um, insulation, one pound mass load of vinyl, one inch insulation bat after that. And finally, you're into the outer cavity uh, where your exterior wall would be, um, which I don't have shown right here. But that's our entire back wall. And this same wall here is what's going to go around the entire system. So let me show you that real quick. I'm just going to put everything back. So this wall right here uh, goes around the whole way and it's just representing that wall I just showed you. I just didn't want to have to rebuild it for each little thing. So the side wall here, the side wall on the other side and the back wall are all built the same except for the waveguide panel is only on the back wall and the top of our studio. So that brings us now to the front wall, which is a really important part of this design. This is called a non-environment control room and the name stems from the idea that you really don't hear the environment of the room at all, yet it's not anechoic, meaning that there's absolutely no reflections because that's really tiresome to work in. So no, no um, engineer would want to work in an anechoic chamber for very long, even if it's good for speaker accuracy. So when I'm looking at this here, I've gone ahead and since this is a high-end studio, I had a little fun with this. This is like a 48 channel SSL board. We've got our person. Um, this is centered on this wall here and it's pulled back roughly about 10 feet, a little bit lower. And then these guys are angled at roughly not quite 30 degrees, but a little bit wider just to give that breadth that's needed for the mains in a, in a, Pro control room like this, a lot of times people would either put like some small NS10s on their control meter board here, or you might have a small pair of speakers just, you know, slightly above uh, for listening near field or close field is actually a better term for that. Um, so these are actually going to be called like uh, the longest monitors here. So these are not near fields. They're not even mid fields. These are technically technically long fields um, and they're going to be, you know, the most expensive. These guys are probably about, I don't know, I think they're about 20,000. I looked them up. Um, so, you know, when you're putting this much money into a studio control room, you got to also have your $20,000 monitors that we're going to hit the room in the right way. One of the reasons these monitors are really desirable in a control room is because they usually have 12 to 18 inch um, speaker diaphragm so that you're getting much better low frequency response. You can even throw a subwoofer in there as well. And, and this will give you the best listening experience of the full spectrum that you can possibly get. And the whole idea is that you're getting down to 20 Hertz, the, the threshold of hearing. And then this room design is controlling that 20 Hertz so that you're not getting unnecessary sounds and you could mix and master in this room easily, very quickly. Everything you hear from the speakers would be accurate. Now this wall is built with stone and the outer layer of this wall is stone because we want these speakers to be in a very, very stiff wall. We don't want the speakers to send their vibrations into the wall itself and then the whole wall become part, basically a diaphragmatic speaker that is pushing sound into the room. So the speakers are usually gonna be set on something really heavy like a concrete foundation or concrete foundation stands that's gonna be decoupled as much as possible from the rest of the room and they're going to, you can see right here, they're sitting out a little bit. And then you also need to build some sort of ventilation system. It could just simply be a, a, a space behind the speakers that then vents into the room so that there's airflow behind them. And then we also are going to have 
in his book, Newell's talks about the front wall. He doesn't go into this. This is kind of his secret that he keeps to himself. He doesn't teach you how to set up the monitors or how to build the front wall. That's the one thing he leaves out. But essentially he talks about it as, you know, seven layers of damping material. This could be doing a sandwich of like plywood, mass load of vinyl, plywood, uh, half inch drywall, mass load of vinyl. So just think about it as much mass as you can get in that wall within reason and within the budget to really control the low end frequencies from vibrating in that wall. And then his signature is, is the stone finish on the final layer that's going to be highly reflective, which is what he wants. He wants the whole front wall and the floor to remain reflective to keep some sense like I said, of the ambience of the room. So it doesn't get too tiresome to listen in a room like this. The rest of the room is entirely absorbent. As you can see, there's no diffusion on the back wall. Um, professional studio designers have argued for years over this and a lot have come to the conclusion that diffusion on the back wall in a very high end studio like this is actually not desirable because you would need diffusers that are extremely, extremely deep to do it properly. Now, I would say that at this point, you probably have enough space for those big diffusers. But again, this is the non-environment approach where your front wall is extremely reflective, the floor is reflective, and everything else is absorptive. So that is the idea here. This is how the pros do it. Again, I hope you have enjoyed this little series on understanding how it's done. You can see the full isolation shell here. Incredible amount of work, incredible amount of cost. And so you're probably wondering, okay, this is awesome, Wilson, but how does this apply to me in my home studios? And I think there's a lot to learn from this. I think for me as a studio designer these days, I only work with the home studio market right now. And I like learning about these principles because I can try to apply them in some of the designs. We can try to get our home project studios, as, a, as they used to be called, to a higher caliber than they are now. And this will increase, I think what's going to happen in the future is more and more people are going to be getting better and better home studios. And the quality of the music that we put out in the world is going to only increase. There's been a period where I've noticed with the advent of Spotify and things like that, a lot of the independent artist music that we hear, it can be really good music, but the quality of the production, the quality of the sounds they're getting is not so good. Um, and this also depends on the genre. You know, if you're using just samples, you're never really recording vocals, you know, you can do it all quote unquote in the box then maybe the quality of your room doesn't matter. But at some point, you're going to want someone who can hear and mix and master a song really well. And why not make it your own room? Why not, why not try to eliminate more and more people down the chain um, if, you, if you can? You know, if we can start to get better and better quality rooms. And, and the thing that I think is interesting is your recordings will improve, your mixing will improve, your ears will improve. Everything will be easier if you build your rooms from the start with a little bit more ease um, and understanding of how it all works. So that's kind of what I hope you've learned from this. Also, maybe you learned it's prohibitively expensive and ridiculous amount of space, but that gives you a perspective of just what go what goes into these really high end studios. And maybe also the next time you're working in one, you could, you know, understand what's behind the walls, really have a feeling for, for how much effort went into these studios, because it is pretty remarkable. All right. So with all that said, thank you so much for watching on this series. Uh, again, watch part one. If you haven't already, it'll tell you about the isolation side of this build. And then if you're on this journey of building a studio in your home, definitely check out my free workshop. It's at soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop. That's soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop. All right. I'll see you all next week with more information on studio, home studio design and construction. Thank you.